So I want to welcome you to the Professional Wisdom of the Digital Age webinar. This is a presentation of the New York State and CSA Partnership for Education and Training. My name is Kyle Nurse, and I'll be your host for our webinar today. And I'm joined by our instructor, Mr. Mike Willis. Now, at this point in time, I'm going to mute everyone's microphones and keep the background noise at a minimum. As you can see, I need to mute my own because the radio just came on suddenly, um, so I apologize. If you do have any questions, you can click on the raise hand button at the bottom of the participants panel. Again, that's that icon of the little hand that's in the air, and I will try and put my arrow next to it. it might not be 100%, but it'll be in that vicinity. All right, so you have your raised hand button. You raise your hand, I'll click unmute, and then you can ask your question. If everybody could do me a favor and just raise your hand right now so I know you know where that button is, that would be great. If everybody on the call could go ahead and raise their hand. Uh, it looks like the majority of us raised our hands. Some of us are either not on the call yet or Okay, so those of you who raised your hand, if you go ahead and take your hand down for me. All right, excellent, excellent. Uh, I need a couple more hands to come down. Island, take your hand down. Babu, take your hand down, please. All right. Now, if you don't want to talk to us and you don't want to raise your hand, but you do have a question, you can also use the text chat feature. We've been using that this morning. The chat box is looking at the bottom right-hand side of the screen. I just want you to make sure that all participants is selected in the send area um, before you hit send. That way, everybody who's on the call can see your question, comment, or concern. So as I mentioned previously, today's webinar is sponsored by the New York State CSEA Partnership for Education and Training, or as many people like to call it simply as the partnership. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the partnership, um, we're basically an organization that administers education and training programs for CSEA represented employees, and we do this through labor management cooperation. Now, the partnership is totally funded through negotiated agreements between both New York State and CSEA. As an organization, we offer in-person classroom training, online learning, educational advisement services, grants, tuition benefits, labor management services, as well as other education and training programs, including the webinar that you are attending today. Now, in essence, I want you to think of the partnership, like I said, as a joint labor management organization. And our sole mission is to promote your career mobility, improve your job skills, support your workplace safety and health, as well as promote effective labor and management relationships back on the job uh, and within your agency and facility. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more about us, you can hit us up via our website or you can call us directly. I have our contact information on the screen, and I'll also provide that contact information at the end of today's webinar. But now that you know a little bit more about the partnership, let's dive into professionalism in the digital age, and I'm going to turn your presentation over to Mr. Mike Willis. Thank you, Kyle. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad you could join us today. This webinar introduces best practices for popular forms of digital or electronic communication in the workplace. It'll identify the best way to maintain a professional image as you use email, instant messaging, mobile devices, such as your smartphone, and social media. We'll also discuss how privacy and confidentiality impact our use of digital workplace communications. And along the way, we'll apply what we've learned to the workplace. As we move through this course, we'll be offering you a type of compass on how to navigate the changing environment of digital communication while keeping a professional manner. The image you see on the screen will give you an idea of the roadmap we'll be following to cover these topics. So what exactly is etiquette?
Emily Post says, etiquette is the, the consideration for the rights and feelings of others, not merely uh, a rule for public behavior, but the very foundation upon which social life is built. The idea of etiquette can seem like an old fashioned idea, but it has very modern applications. In general, etiquette is based on respect for others. Treating others kindly and politely is the single most important uh, uh, aspect of what it means to be a professional in the workplace. In other words, respect for others is uh, the single most important aspect of what it means to be a professional. Good manners at work can set you apart from other people. It can also lower the stress of the people around you and help them to be more productive. When you're mindful of your behavior and the feelings of others, your colleagues and supervisors will be more likely to respect you. And when, when the time comes to fill a job, you may be the one that everyone thinks of. And this is true when we communicate digitally as well. When we use electronic forms of communication, we're still representing our agency and ourselves just as we would be if we were speaking in person. There are differences too, and we'll explore that. As I said, we designed this webinar to provide guidance for you around the use of these technologies at work. We base this advice on common business practices. So let's look at how you can apply the principles of etiquette to our digital business lives. Actually, I'd like to start by asking you a question. Most of us use some form of digital communication whether it's email, instant messaging, or texting. Is there anyone who does not use one of these forms of communication at work? And if so, please let us know. Al? So what I'd like for you to do is click on the red X if you do not currently use email, instant messaging, or texting at work. Again, you can find the red X at the bottom of the participants panel, two buttons over from your raised hand feature. So go ahead and click on the red X if you do not currently use email, instant messaging, or texting at work. And we have one red X up, but that red X was up for a while. Um, Michelle needs to bring hers down. But for the most part, Mike, it looks like everyone who is on the call uses some form of email, instant messaging, or texting at work. Well, I'm not surprised to see that you all need some form of di digital communication at work. So now we're going to talk about you know, why digital uh, etiquette is so important. So, you know, as we saw, we all use some form of di digital communication every day at work. In fact, you might be surprised to hear uh, that a 2018 study found that the average person picks up their cell phone about 52 times a day. And I took a look at some more recent studies, and they range anywhere from 90 to 300 times a day. So in addition, the lines between personal and work use of cell phones are more blurred than ever. The same study found that 70% of individuals surveyed use their phone uh, for work outside of working hours, and 84% use their personal phones during working hours. So let's talk about how these technologies affect our behavior at work and, and even how other people see us when we use these technologies. So etiquette is probably something that we've all heard of, but etiquette in the digital age is a relatively new idea. When we were growing up, we were taught things like saying please and thank you or opening the door for someone. But did anyone tell you whether uh, you should text at the dinner table? I guess that depends how old you are. How about whether uh, you should friend your uh, boss on Facebook? Things have changed rapidly in the world, especially when we talk about the changes that computers and the internet have brought us. So does it matter if you pay attention to manners when it comes to digital communications? Well, if you look at the charts, you'll see that your boss says a resounding yes. If we go through these topics, you'll probably find that some of them are not a problem for you. You may find that others make you say, eh, you know, maybe I should work on that and maybe try to get a little bit better. And I think we all have some room for improvement. So let's begin by talking about the use of email messages, texting, and IMing or instant messaging at work.
We'll talk about email first. But before we do, let me ask you a question. In your opinion, what are the advantages uh, and maybe disadvantages of email? So what do you think? Kyle? So I'd like for you to type your ideas about the advantages and disadvantages of email in the chat box. Again, the chat box can be found at the bottom right-hand side of the screen. Uh, and once you make sure all participants is labeled before hitting send. So I see disadvantages, tone not portrayed can be misunderstood. Um, and the advantage is that it's quick. Thank you, Jennifer. Let me hear from a couple others. Christy chimed in, you can take your time to make sure the information is correct. Excellent, yes you can. Um, that's an advantage. Frank C says you can keep a log um, with regards to what is being said. A disadvantage, Holly chimed in, easy to misread or misunderstand. Um, and another advantage, faster communication. So as you can see, Mike, there are both advantages and disadvantages to using email. I think everybody is spot on. So uh, great. Thank you for your comments. All right, so let's move on. All right, it's time to be honest. Have you ever sent an email to the wrong person by accident? If you have, I'd like you to click on the raise hand button. So if you've ever sent an email to the wrong person by accident, please click the raise hand button. And I'm going to go ahead and raise my hand because I am definitely guilty of that. Um, so if you've ever sent an email to the wrong person, go ahead and click that raise hand button. Um, I see, Edward, you have a green checkup. Go ahead, if you're wanting to raise your hand, go ahead and click on the hand icon. Um, but it looks like we have about 14 or 15 folks on the call, Mike, that have absolutely done this and sent an email to the wrong person. Well, I'm not surprised to see a lot of hands. I know I've done it. Usually it's because I was in a hurry and didn't take time to check to see if I had the right person's name in the send to box. I also found, I don't know about your email programs, but if I started to type M-I-K, it's going to autofill somebody's name, and it may not autofill the right person's name. Uh, so, you know, be careful. And if you want to avoid embarrassing email blunders like this one, we need to discuss uh, some of the email best practices. And before we move on, I'm just going to ask everybody to please bring your hands down. I have about seven or eight hands that are still up. Please bring your hands down so that we can use that feature in the future. Okay. Thanks, Kyle. So we'll be reviewing these four best practices for writing email messages next. So be courteous, respect privacy, use that reply all uh, carefully, and then proofread for tone. And several of you mentioned uh, how uh, tone isn't very well reflected in an email. So let's start by discussing our first tip, that is be courteous. It's best to avoid typing in all capital letters or in large uh, fonts in your email. You may be tempted to do this for emphasis, but in the digital world, the use of all caps is considered the same as shouting or yelling. Now, I have a little story to tell you. My uncle, who is about uh, 103 years old, uh, still is you know, very active online and emails friends and family frequently. I talked to my cousin recently who told me that uh, you know, if I were to get an email from my uncle, that he types all in caps, but he's not really yelling at me. It's because his eyesight isn't so good and he wants to be able to, to, to read the email, uh, so he types all in caps. So and, and unless you know, you're, you're visually challenged, as my uncle is, don't use caps. Uh, and also, when someone makes a mistake in their email, whether it's a spelling error or an email mistakenly sent to the wrong person, be kind about it. If it's a minor error like a typo, probably don't need to say anything. If the mistake is something you feel will have a big impact, then you know, think carefully before responding so you don't come across too strongly or maybe even self-righteous. And remember, you could have made that same mistake just as easily. Uh, so, you know, being respectful about this is, again, part of being a professional. It's general, uh, in general, it's best to avoid giving bad news or criticism using email. It's more respectful to pick up the phone or deliver that news in person. 
The next tip is to respect privacy. You may assume that email is a secure way of sending information, but you should know that your agency oversees digital channels like email. So this means that anything you write and send generally is not private. It may even become public if there's an internal investigation or court case. And as you should know, deleting an email doesn't really erase it. It's always kind of out there in the digital world and can be retrieved. So again, think very carefully before you write or send any emails. And you know, we've seen some stories in the news recently about some old emails from 10, 20 years ago uh, that uh, have been discovered and have very much damaged uh, somebody's uh, reputation and career and, and impacted their organization negatively. So be very careful about this. Our third tip concerns the use of CC or copy and the reply all features in your email program. Sometimes I feel like I'm being overwhelmed by an avalanche of unnecessary email at work. Have you ever felt that way? If you want to avoid doing that to other people, one thing you can do is to stop using that CC and reply all uh, feature unless you really need to. When you send an email, the recipients in the send to field should be the main people uh, the message is intended for. The CC recipients are those you want to publicly inform of the message. However, as you probably know, this feature is often overused or even misused. When you do want to copy people, it's best to let the main recipients know that you have copied others by writing something like, you know, I've copied John Smith in on this. You can, uh, this can help you avoid overusing the feature since you'll be forced to think about why you're in, uh, including certain people on the CC line. It's also not a bad idea to do the same thing when you use the reply all feature. In fact, you may want to think carefully uh, whether or not you really need to use reply all. Not only is replying uh, to all generally not necessarily not necessary, it can actually result in a technical problem for your email system. For example, in 2016, employees of Wells Fargo sent a message to 90,000 users using the CC feature. Quite a few of those people hit reply all to respond. This accidental reply all chain ended up in backing up millions of emails and putting uh, some time sensitive transactions at risk of failing to meet regulatory requirements. So do this very, very carefully. And our last tip is to proofread your emails before you send them, especially for their content and tone of voice. You may not think that this is important, but a study in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology found that people misinterpreted the meaning and tone of emails they received up to 50% of the time. As with other forms of written communication, it's important to proofread for errors and misspelled words, as I mentioned a moment ago, and checking to see if you have the right name in the send to box. But with email, you'll also want to uh, read for the overall tone of the message to make sure it's respectful, as well as clear to the reader. Because email lacks those emotional cues, such as the tone of your voice uh, and your nonverbal facial expressions, Sometimes our words uh, can be misinterpreted or, misinterpreted or even seen as rude. The best policy is to put yourself in the shoes of the other person and think before you send. You can find some uh, other uh, great email tips in one of the handouts that we included with this course. And if you haven't printed the handouts out yet, that's okay. You can do so after the webinar. Um, you should have received your handouts a week or two ago. Uh, there would have been an attachment to the confirmation email um, that you received telling you that you were uh, accepted into this class. So, um, and you would have gotten that from either a Gene Gray Bear or a Tim Buddenhagen. So you can always go back and get those after the fact. All right. So next we'd like to review some best practices for instant messaging and texting. If you use IM or texting at work, you can carry over many of the practices we spoke about for email, such as proofreading for tone. However, here are a few tips that are specific to these communication tools. So first, 
keep these types of messages short. A good rule of thumb is to consider the length of a Twitter tweet, that is uh, 280 characters, as a limit. If you need to go longer than that, maybe you should switch to email. And I got to tell you, I got a text uh, message last night from a friend of mine that took me probably about four minutes to read. And I had to scroll just you know, down and down and down through the text message to finally get to the end. And you know, this is just a big no-no. So second, go light on text speak, including shortcut phrases like LOL and using emoticons or smiley faces. In fact, the, uh, the, the Unicode standard has, has developed 3,633 different emojis. And I don't know about you, I don't know what all of them mean, and some of them are so similar I can't distinguish one from the other. So I'm, I'm very careful in what I'm using and when I use them. And I certainly don't use them in any kind of uh, business or professional communication. Uh, so these may be more informal ways of communicating, but you still want to maintain that professional image when you use IM or texting at work. And also, not everyone knows the acronyms and emoticons can be uh, misinterpreted. And finally, don't assume someone is standing by to respond. Your coworkers have their own schedules and deadlines. They not, may not be able to, res, you know, to respond to you right away. And also, if you need to end a text or instant message in conversation, tell them that you're signing off for now. That way, they, you won't leave them hanging, waiting for a response from you. All right. So now that you're familiar with some of the best practices for using email, let's see if you can apply them to the following situation. Luis works at the Office of Information Technology Services, ITS. He's writing an email to uh, employees at a call center at the Department of Tax and Finance. So let's see how he does. So, you know, this is from Luis Ortiz. It's sent on that date is to uh, everybody at the uh, tax call center, and it's CC'd to uh, everybody in ITS and tax and finance. The subject, new phone features effective immediately, and the, the message simply reads, the new call features are in effect, discontinue uh, the old call feature, or there will be problems in the system. So given what you know about the four best practices, which of the following areas should Luis be working on to improve his emails? And you can pick more than one answer if you want. So to be courteous, respect privacy, don't overuse CC and reply all, and proofread for tone. So let's see, what do you think? So I'd like for you to notice that I've opened up the polling panel on the right-hand side of the screen. I want you to take your mouse and click on as many options or as many of the options that you think Luis can do a little bit better with, A, B, C, or D, um, and let us know. So I'm going to open up that poll, and I'm going to wait for individuals to tap on it, and let's see what we get. So the poll is open. You're tapping fast and fiercely, I see. Excellent. We've got about 13 people in progress. And I'm waiting on another 13 people to go ahead and start that poll. All right, excellent. Moving along, Mike. We have about another seven people who need to start the poll. Okay. I'll give you about another 30 seconds. I've got like five folks, actually it's two folks, um, who need to hit this poll up, and then I will go ahead and close it. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. Now let me share those results. And as you can see, Mike, it's kind of over the board. 42% uh, of the group felt that uh, Luis could work on D, um, you know, proofreading for tone. 19% um, of the group, or five people, 
felt uh, he can improve on not overusing CC and reply all. And 15% of the group said that he could work on being uh, more courteous uh, with regards to his emails. Okay. All right. Well, I would say that Luis wasn't as courteous as he could have been in his email. I'm also not happy that he typed the subject line in all caps. That gives a feeling that he's shouting at his readers, which might give them a bad feeling. He did fine on the privacy issue, as you all noted, uh, as far as we can tell. I would say that he has a problem with overusing CC, though. I'd question whether all of the people who work at ITS and all of the people who work at tax and finance need to get this message, since it's primarily intended for tax and finance call center employees. And likewise, I would say that it could have been more clear. Does everyone know what the old calling feature is so that they can stop using it? And are we supposed to stop using one call feature or multiple calling features? So overall, I'd say that uh, he could do some work on A, C, and D. And we should keep in mind who will be reading the email and to ask himself, is he being clear about what he wants them to know? If he takes time to do these things, he'll improve his chances of being understood and therefore minimize the number of help desk calls or tickets submitted on this issue, which means less work for him. And, you know, he, remember, he's representing not only himself, but his agency here. And I'm not sure he did such a good job. So he's creating more work for himself. He's diminishing his, uh, you know, his status and, and the way people perceive him uh, outside and within his agency. And he's also creating more work for himself and uh, negatively impacting the view people will have of ITS. So uh, before we move on, does anybody have any questions? So if anyone does have any questions, go ahead and click on the raised hand feature. Um, just looking in the chat, uh, Catherine, Valerie, uh, Island, you all kind of hit on another thing that he could work on, which was like punctuation. Um, if you notice uh, at the end of the sentence, there's no period here. Um, you know, so he can absolutely, uh, you know, proofread for more than just tone. So excellent catches um, from those of you. And Mike, as I look at the participant panel, um, I do see a hand. I see Michelle has her hand up. Michelle, did you have a question? No, I just don't know how to take it down. Just click on it again. I tried that. And it's gone. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Sure. All right, Mike. So it doesn't look like we have any questions in the, uh, the panel nor in the chat, so we can move on. All right. Thank you. Okay. So I'd like to challenge you now. So based on what you've learned, how do you think you would handle this situation? So one of your coworkers just called me an idiot in an email. So what do you think I should do? So if you have ideas about how you would handle this situation, go ahead and type them in the text chat. And I see Nicole chimed in right away. Um, she said that she would just ignore this person. Uh, and Rebecca chimed in, she would ignore this individual as well. So go ahead and tell me in the text chat, how would you handle this situation? One of your coworkers just called you an idiot in an email. Um, Island said, if that's a thing that bothers you, print the email and go down to HR, go to your supervisor and not use this format, ignore or forward to my supervisor. Um, Edward said, it takes one to no one. You would not want to reply with that, though, Edward, um, <laughs> although it would be funny. Um, and Valerie chimed in, I would probably respond and ask for clarification while CCing my supervisor. Okay. Um, Christy said, I would not answer, uh, and if it happened again, then I would address it, so she would give her a pass. Um, Jennifer chimed in, it depends on how it's happening, but, you know, keep the email for the future. And, Jen, make sure all participants is labeled when you message, because I believe I'm the only one that saw your response. Um, so, Mike, as you can see, uh, a variety of different responses are coming in, and they range from ignoring this individual to uh, replying uh, and CCing our supervisor to just forwarding the email to our supervisor. Okay. Well, I think those are all pretty good ideas. 
So think about this situation a bit more. You know, you're bound to be angry or annoyed or frustrated if someone, you know, were to call you an idiot. But what would show the most respect in this bad situation? You know, you might consider some of the following options. You know, uh, you know, are they just trying to be funny? You know, kind of is the tone clear or unclear uh, in that message? Um, you know, you don't have to stoop to their level. You're going, they're not being very professional. You know, how would you deal with this professionally? You know, anybody can have a bad day. You know, if this is a, a one-off single offense, you know, maybe as, as several of you said, you just drop it. You know, on the other hand, if, if the pattern, you know, uh, you know, you have some options. You can confront them directly. You can forward it to HR. You can forward it to your supervisor. Uh, so, you know, maybe you did something wrong. Maybe you really are an idiot. I don't know, you know. But remember, uh, you know, your coworker doesn't always practice good email etiquette, and they don't always behave professionally. That doesn't mean that you should put your professionalism aside. Okay. And I just wanted to highlight one of the comments in the box. Uh, Eileen uh, said, today it's an idiot, tomorrow it could turn into violence. So again, for those of you who said that you might ignore it, just think twice about that because I do believe in that. Today it's a name, tomorrow it might be, you know, they put their hands on you or try to or think that they can. Um, so definitely pay attention to, um, you know, the signs and uh, signals. Excellent. So we're okay. going to move on to our roadmap, and I'm going to give it to Mike again. All right. So let's talk about mobile devices uh, like cell phones, smartphones, and tablets next. So here's another question for you. In your opinion, do you think that the growth in the use of mobile devices like smartphones and tablets in the workplace have increased or decreased the number of incidents of bad etiquette at work? What do you think? Yes or no? Better or worse? So if you believe that etiquette is better now that we have digital devices, I want you to click on the green check. If you think that etiquette is worse now that we have digital devices in play, I want you to click on the red X. And again, they are both found at the bottom of the participants panel. And we have quite a few red Xs. Um, some people didn't respond. I have some people in uh, the text chat that are saying worse. Um, Island uh, feels as though it didn't really change much. Edwards said that it's better. Um, so we do have one green check. All right, so the majority of the group feels as though it's gotten worse. We have one individual that feels as though it didn't change and one individual that feels as though it's better. Okay. Well, let's see what a recent survey on this topic found. So if you answered things are worse, you agree with the CEOs that were surveyed about this topic. 50% said that they feel mobile devices have increased the amount of bad behavior in the workplace. But if you're one of those uh, who are, you know, but are, are, are you one of those who are displaying this bad etiquette? Have you ever used your cell phone inappropriately at work? I know I have, and I, I'm trying to not do that anymore. If you aren't sure what good cell phone etiquette is, stay tuned. We're going to be discussing that next. Cell phones are probably the most common handheld device out there. So when you are at work, you should follow some of these simple rules. So first, keep it to a minimum. Any personal communication on mobile devices during work should be kept to a minimum. Even, you know, if you have a state-provided phone, you shouldn't be using it for personal calls at all. And consider the impact. Mobile devices, no, mobile device use affects you and the people you work with because it impacts how much work you can get done in a day. It can also be distracting to the people sitting near you if you're talking loudly on your phone. It's best to step away, maybe into a conference room or outside or into a stairwell uh, and to speak quietly. And then be considerate. Texting prevents you from paying attention to those around you. People notice this more than you might think. You might be okay uh, 
you might think that it's okay to be on your phone during meetings because you're answering work emails, but really it's inconsiderate and disrespectful, uh, and it sends a signal to the people in the room uh, that they just aren't that important to you. And then finally, be accountable. If you're expecting an urgent call or a message on your cell phone during a meeting, mention it to the meeting leader or those around you, and then step away uh, when you take the call or type a response. All right, so based on what you've learned about mobile device etiquette, how do you think you would handle this situation? You know, can I text my boss to let her know I'm not coming in today? So what do you think about that? So you have ideas about how to handle this situation. I want you to go ahead and type them in the text chat box. Can I text my boss to let her know I'm not coming in today? Um, I mean, according to HR, we're supposed to call. Depends on the office culture, says Barb. Um, Nicole says yes. Um, Valerie says it depends. Um, nah, Eileen says that no, it needs to be a phone call, not an email or a text message. Frank says it depends on the office. Yes, as long as the boss is okay with it. Um, I have, I've used OT. I used to have employees do that with me all the time outside the state. Okay, I got you. Um, depends on the relationship with boss that's established. So we're hearing uh, an overall that it depends um, on the culture and the relationship with the individual that you would be texting. Okay. Well, I have to say, you know, I would agree. I think it does depend. So let's kind of think through the situation for a moment. So here are some things to think about in this case. Now, first, uh, what would show the most respect in this situation? What do you know about your boss? Does she love her cell phone? Does she hate it? Has your boss told uh, you uh, her preference about how she wants to be informed of these things? You know, is there a policy in place at your agency about how calling in sick is to be handled? So all of these things would impact your decision to use text as a means of communication uh, with your boss. So do you have any questions about this situation or anything else about mobile devices? So if you do have a question, go ahead and raise your hand or you can click on the, um, or you just drop it in the text chat and we'll respond in time. Um, for those of you who have not brought your red X's down, please bring those down just so we're not muddying the waters. So if you if you still have a red X or a green check up, please bring that down by clicking on the red X or the green check at the bottom of the participants panel. All right, I'm looking in the text, the text chat doesn't look like we have anything, Mike, and I'm not seeing any, um, Valerie just chimed in, no, but I appreciate that it's not, it's an Android device in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm a fellow Android too, Valerie, so I appreciate you. All right, so it looks like we're good, Mike, so we're going to move on and we're going to go okay. back to our roadmap. All right, so next let's talk about using social media at work. Social media is a powerful tool for sharing information, broadcasting news stories, connecting with others, and building relationships. Whether you use social media on or off the job, there are many benefits to communicating through social media. There are also several drawbacks, mainly inappropriate use, legal ramifications, and then certainly a lack of privacy. So let's take a look at a few best practices for using social media. So the first is keep your social media to a minimum. Using your, your personal social media accounts at work just makes you less productive. And you certainly don't want to be known as that person who's always on Facebook. And again, do you know your agency's policy regarding social media on your work computer or phone versus your personal phone? And then second, avoid rude or inappropriate comments. Stay away from offensive comments, jokes, or the use of profanity online. If you wouldn't feel comfortable with your mother or your boss seeing the comments, then probably you shouldn't post it. Third, don't vent your frustrations, your work frustrations online. Ne negative comments that you make about your coworkers, your agency, or the state of New York on your personal social media account will only make you look bad. 
these posts can easily be seen by the wrong person and come back to haunt you. And remember, what you post in social media could be there forever. And then finally, don't make your agency or facility look bad. Before you post anything, think twice. It's important when, when it comes to posting comments on your agency's official social media page. The boss will not thank you if you put your agency in a bad light before the public. No doubt about that. All right, so I'd like to ask you a question. Let's say you work at a state park and you notice that the hours for the park's upcoming summer season have been posted incorrectly on the agency's social media site. This will confuse customers and even other employees. So however you don't handle the park's social media postings as part of your job, so what do you think you should do? So I want you to type any ideas that you might have on the best way to handle this situation in the chat box. Again, that's at the bottom right-hand side. We've been using it. So you are a state park employee. You notice that the hours for the uh, park's upcoming summer season are incorrect. How would you handle this situation? And Valerie chimes in message, email the department to let them know. Lisa chimes in, reach out to the person responsible for the change or for the page. Um, Lisa also said either by email or phone. Uh, Eileen, contact a social media specialist if I know the number. Uh, if not, just sit and laugh. Okay. <laughs> All right, we got some funny ones on the call today. I love it. Um, Michelle, notify the person or office that handles the hours. So a lot of them said that they would notify someone um, and they would do it either uh, via phone or email. Um, and it would either be their supervisor or the individual who was responsible for the change, Mike. Okay, I, that, that makes sense to me. So you're not going to remain silent. Yes. Unless you're island and you're going to sit back and laugh. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So how many of you work at agencies with a social media presence on the Internet? And if you do, please raise your hand. So go ahead and raise your hand if your agency has a presence on social media. So we got about 10. Um, and I would like to think that the majority of your agencies do, so I would like to see a little bit more hands come on up. Um, but it looks like we've got about 11 folks, 12 folks on the call that said that their agency has a presence on social media, Mike. Okay. Well, more and more agencies are relying on social media platforms to connect with the public. And those social media platforms include uh, Facebook, Twitter, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Flickr, uh, Pinterest, and YouTube. So some of you said that your agency has a presence on social media. And if you're not sure whether your agency uses social media, there is a resource you can check. And here's a snapshot of the website, ny.gov forward slash agencies. And once you go to that page, if you scroll down, you'll see a list of the 100 uh, New York State agencies. So take a look at the section for the Adirondack Park Agency. And notice under its name, uh, next to the word follow, there are the icons for social media channels it uses. In this case, Facebook represented by the F icon and Twitter represented by the bird icon. And if you click on the Facebook icon, you'll be brought to the agency's Facebook page and so on. If you notice uh, the agency beneath it, the authority's budget office, they don't appear to use any social media programs right now. So as we've discussed, social media is not just a way to meet uh, others. It's a powerful tool for sharing up-to-the-minute information with thousands of users at once. So for example, if you work at uh, DOT, you might know that the DOT Twitter account alerts its followers to traffic events affecting travel and road conditions in their area. This is an example of a state agency using social media to reflect their mission and their values. So here's another digital etiquette challenge for you. Should I friend my boss on Facebook? 
So based on what you've learned about social media etiquette, how do you think you would handle this situation? And I'm seeing them come in and I'm seeing no right now. <laughs> I, <laughs> I live, for instance, when we had the New York Tough turn into New York Touch. I laughed. <laughs> okay. I actually laughed too. That was on the news. Um, but I'm looking and a lot of folks, Mike, are chiming in, no, you do not friend your boss on Facebook. Some absolutely not. Um, John Lucchese, or Lucchese uh, said, you want, maybe you ask your boss first. It depends on the relationship. But for the most part, individuals, Mike, are saying no. Okay. So I, I kind of tend to agree with that. So in general, social media uh, networks were designed to connect uh, to friends and family. However, as you know, social media is being used more and more for business purposes. So I'm going to assume that most of you don't use your agency's official social media account. So let's look at this question from the point of view of a person using their personal Facebook account. In this case, you should really think about the decision carefully before you would ask to friend your boss, since he or she would see all of the posts placed on your wall from your friends and family, and you. Can you be sure that those posted items or photographs wouldn't embarrass you? It's fine to say, uh, you know, it's fine if you say that uh, you spend your day focused on your job and rarely post and never rant about work. But you should also consider whether your coworkers and your boss would be receptive to a friend request on social media. In fact, in a 2018 survey, 49.2% of managers responded by saying that they weren't comfortable being friended by people at work. So if there any questions or comments or thoughts about this situation or social media etiquette in general? So if you have any questions, comments, or concerns with regards to this situation or just social media etiquette in general, go ahead, raise your hand, or you can drop it in the text chat and we'll respond in kind. I know that I work in a, uh, uh, an agency where um, it's, very, it's very different. Uh, and one half of the agency, um, it's very, very corporate, very, very nobody's friends on Facebook. And then on the other half of the agency, it seems like everyone is friends, um, I'm noticing. So it really does depend on the climate, the relationships, et cetera, like Mike said. And I'm not seeing any hands, Mike. Oh, I do see a hand. Hold on. Lori. Lori, did you have a question? Good morning, Lori. I can hear you typing. Okay, so you can talk to me and tell me no. Go ahead, take your hand down for me then, Lori. Excellent. Lisa, did you have a question? Lisa, do you have a question? Oh, she went and took her hand down. All right, and there's, there's nothing in the chat mic, so it looks like we are good to move on. Oh, thank you. All right. well, that's the, uh, the conservation. <laughs> All right. So our last topic is privacy and confidentiality. So no matter what your job is, every state agency has guidelines for the use of digital forms of communication like those we've discussed today. Those guidelines will generally answer questions like whether you're allowed to use your mobile, uh, your own mobile devices, personal email, and social media accounts at work. If you don't know where to find these guidelines, check with your supervisor or the HR department of your agency to find out more. In addition to your agency's policies, there are also uh, general statewide policies concerning the use of digital communication. And we've included a handout with links to the digital technology guidelines for the state from the Office of Information Technology. I'll make sure you take a look at that if you're unclear. It's important to remember that no correspondence is totally private, but that digital communication is even less secure. So for example, email is less secure, uh, is less secure than written communication. A simple rule of thumb when using digital communication is not to post anything that you wouldn't want shared publicly. 
you should also keep in mind that whatever you share digitally may be public information for a long period of time, even if you try to modify or delete it. It's also a good idea to check the privacy settings on your social media accounts to make sure that only the people you want can see your personal profile. We've included a handout to help you do this with your course materials. Maintaining the confidentiality of the information you use at work is crucial, especially in emails and other workplace communications. If, that, if this data is not handled correctly, it can become a legal issue or put your agency in an embarrassing position, such as appearing in the news. It's important for employees as well as the organization to protect sensitive information and data for the good of the New York State citizens we all serve. Confidential information includes data that would identify people, such as personal information and social security numbers, as well as financial data. Just as confidential paper documents should be stored in locked file cabinets, confidential electronic documents should have pass, uh, password or network security. You should also leave, uh, avoid leaving confidential information visible on your computer monitor when you leave your workstation. Confidential information should be disposed of properly when the time comes, and that includes electronic data. For example, did you know that CDs, hard drives, and laptops can be shredded too? If you aren't sure how to dispose of electronic, da electronic data, ask your supervisor or agency security officer. So this is a tough one. I just sent an email with confidential information to the wrong person. What should I do? In this situation, it could have big consequences for you personally and for your organization. So let's think about this challenge. So based on what you've learned, how do you think you should handle this problem? So if you have any ideas about how you would handle this situation, go ahead and put them in the text chat. Um, I just sent an email with confidential information to the wrong person. What do I do now? And the cold time in, recall the email. Um, there is a thing with Outlook that you can unsend it. Recall, Eileen, yep. Notify your supervisor immediately. Thank you, John. Um, email the person back immediately or call and ask them to not read it and delete. Um, pray to get it back, contact IT, your supervisor. Um, so a, a lot of folks are saying that they were trying to recall the email, and if they couldn't recall the email, that they would contact the person or contact IT and their supervisor, Mike. Okay. So those are really good ideas. Let's also uh, remember that we're talking about confidential information here, not just a simple email. So let's think through the situation a bit more. Recalling a message doesn't always work, so I wouldn't trust it in this case. We do want to limit the impact of our mistake, though. If it was a normal email that was sent to the wrong person, I'd say just think about what would show the most respect for the people impacted by the error. This situation is a bit different, though. Since we are speaking about confidential information, you should probably let your boss or your supervisor know as soon as possible. There are also New York State laws and policies in place on how these things need to be handled. Again, this is a situation where you might want to check with your agency security officer. Well, that just about wraps things up for this topic today. I want to thank you for joining me today and for your participation. We do have a few minutes before we close to answer any questions or hear your thoughts or comments uh, uh, before we wrap things up. So before we move on to questions and answers, I'd like to turn this back over to Kyle. We'll talk with you about some upcoming uh, webinars and our course evaluation. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, I'd like to thank Mike. Thank you, Mike, for this great webinar.